Uh oh everyone, my hateritis is flaring up again. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time of year, and this year it's severe. Just checking my watch, it's actually quarter past eight. <laughs> it's time, it's overdue. This is the highlight of my year. <laughs> this is my Spotify raps, except the exact opposite. Because it's not music, it's books. And it's not things I loved, it's things I hated. These are the worst books that I read in 2023. Of the 200 books that I read this year, this is the bottom 10%, the bottom dwellers. These books are like <laughs> the literary equivalent of, you know like when you brush your teeth and then you drink orange juice immediately after and it's like the devil threw up in your mouth. That's why I would liken this catalog of books to, you know like when you start to smell something a little bit funky in the air and then you look down and realize you stepped in shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I would describe these books to you. You know, with peace and love, good vibes only. No, I'm kidding, the vibes here are rancid. The vibes are terrible here. If you came for good vibes, you came to the wrong address. Because the hateritis, it is contagious. It's infectious, watch out. Anyway, this is the one video per year, per annum, <laughs> that I allow myself to just be a hater for like, 15 minutes, is that all right? Lock me up, guilty of a good time, okay? So, I will say, if you're an author, respectfully, <laughs> this video might not be for you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Have a great Christmas. Um, <laughs> and we'll see you next time. And now that it's just us, let's dive in to the books. And you know, the climate crisis is real. These are the books that I will be recycling this year as toilet paper, because we love an item with dual purpose. So the first book on this list is the most recent edition for me. I read it very, very recently. I just finished it. This is Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros. She fumbled, she fumbled the bag. This is lovers to enemies for me, not because of anything to do with the contents of the book, but because I loved the first one and now we're enemies. The only flame I'm interested in is one that would burn this to the ground. I would take an iron deficiency any day of the week if it meant I didn't have to read Iron Flame. It took me a minute to get into the first book in this series, The Fourth Wing, but I read it earlier this year and Overall, I liked it. It's an enemies to lovers romanticy, which basically means it combines the romance and the fantasy genres together. And because of the nature of enemies to lovers, it means that the two characters end up as lovers. Now, I feel like the first book was so successful, they just tried to kind of replicate that. They kind of used that first book as a blueprint to create this one. And as a result, they try to recreate the same energy of that enemies to lovers dynamic, but they were already lovers. So they kind of become enemies again in order to re-energize that same tension from the first book and replicate it. And it just didn't work because it didn't really make sense why they would be enemies again, why they would go back to square one in a way. That didn't feel believable or compelling to me, like I just wasn't rooting for their relationship. And I feel like a sequel should expand and extend the universe of the first book, not just try to carbon copy replicate it. And to add insult to injury, doing it badly. Also, quite frankly, every character in this book is just annoying. <laughs> they are cringissimo. That's Italian for cringe, <laughs> by the way. I don't actually know if that's true, I've just decided. And the problem with having a tone that is always very highly strung and self-important kind of kills the pacing because it means there are no climactic moments if every scene is written with the same level of intensity. And this book is so intense, it's like they went camping. But um, here all week, baby. This felt rushed, the writing was not good. There are a lot of mistakes, it's very sloppy. Yeah, this was a flop. Mayor of Floptown population. One. Next we have Really Good Actually, which, <laughs> I'm sorry, this was pretty terrible, actually. This book competed in the Millennial Olympics and won gold. It broke the world record for the most millennial book to ever exist. <laughs> it's insane. I imagine the writer and the main character of the book kind of just having like this look, like the Debbie Ryan meme. That is her personality summed up in an image. It's just a bit like smarmy <laughs> and snarky. Like it's meant to be witty and fun, but the tone is just irritating. And one thing I really like is when a book has anecdotes, because that helps me to really believe the characters and the relationship. So I really don't like a book where we're just told two people are in a relationship or that they're best friends, and then we never actually get to see their dynamic and the softness and the tenderness and the intimate moments between them, like the funny, stories that make them friends or that 
helps us to understand and believe the relationship so that we're rooting for them. And I really hate when books don't have that, but this had that in like abundance to the point where it was too much, <laughs> actually. We kind of just get lists of things, of anecdotes, which are kind of meant to be quirky and funny and silly, but it's just too much. This book went to the university of I'm not like other girls and it passed with flying colors. It got a distinction in that degree. It passed with honors. It's about someone who's going through a breakup and honestly, she's just so insufferable that I thought I would break up with you too, which I don't think was the point. <laughs> I don't think that's what we were supposed to get from this. It's by one of the writers from Schitt's Creek, but I don't think it was giving Schitt's Creek. I think it was just giving shit. <laughs> Sorry, that, okay, that one was mean. That, that was too far. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, this is a book that tells you, but never shows you. This is The List. And this is one of the biggest letdowns of the year for me, unfortunately, because I really had high hopes for this and I expected it to become one of my favorite books because I thought it was going to be this searing, fascinating, social commentary, culture shock of a novel that we're all kind of crying out for in this world where people throw around the terms cancel culture and where there are lots of abuses of power. I thought this book was going to tackle all of those things in a really thoughtful, considered way. And it was basically the opposite of that. This is a book about an Instagram famous couple who are engaged to be married and then just before the wedding, a list is published on Twitter and the man in the couple is accused of assault. Now his wife to be, has always been such an advocate for believing women, believing victims, supporting them, amplifying their voices. So what will she do when she is now the one who has to basically decide, is she gonna believe the victims or believe someone that she loves? Now this sounds brilliant. However, because we dive into the story at the exact moment the list is published online, we never get to see why this couple are in love in the first place. And so the whole time I was like, dump him. I wasn't rooting for them at all. We kind of vacillate between each of the two characters' perspectives, the man and the woman, but it kind of neglected to make us believe in their relationship. And also the whole influencer angle was just dropped straight away. It was just a marketing ploy to sell copies of this book. Like it didn't thoughtfully consider what it would be like to have a platform when this happened and what it would be like to have an audience. There are lots of very convenient moments, like how none of this girl's work colleagues know who her partner is, even though he's A, famous, B, they are known as an Instagram couple, and C, this apparently is a huge scandal. Like, it just, it didn't really make sense to me. There were lots of weird plot holes, I guess. And so this goes on quite slowly for about a month, which I don't think considered the really dangerous way that social media works so quickly. I thought there could have been some really nuanced, interesting takes, and they just weren't any? And it turns out that the man was just kind of falsely accused by an ex's jealous new boyfriend, which I personally feel is incredibly unhelpful for victims of assault, for victims of people more powerful than them in a position of authority, because this doesn't happen regularly. It is so rare that someone is falsely accused. And so to promote this narrative on a large scale, I actually think is damaging and detrimental and unhelpful and to do it in a bland book like this just feels so reductive and the book is trying to do way too much ends up doing too little if anything and uh, i just was so upset with this i was really mad at this book and now unfortunately the list we're talking about is my list of worst books of the year next chain gang all stars this is on so many lists of like best books of 2023 it's on lots of literary prize shortlists and i really don't understand why. This genuinely had me turning into a conspiracy theorist thinking, do these judges only read the blurbs of these books? Because the blurb of this is great, but their execution was not in the sense of like, I left wanting execution, like of myself. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, the concept is fascinating. It's basically about the prison system in America. And it's this kind of dystopian speculative fiction book set in a not too distant future where instead of the death penalty, prisoners fight each other to the death and then the person who survives moves on to the next round, fights a different prisoner and ultimately if they win enough fights against enough prisoners they earn and win their freedom, their liberation. So they replace the death penalty with a televised competition, kind of Hunger Games-esque style. And it's meant to make us uncomfortable as readers because it doesn't really seem that 
unbelievable. And over the course of the book, we get lots of different POVs. We get the perspectives of prisoners who are fighting. We get the perspectives of fans of the show as well as protesters. So the concept was great, but in practice, this just fell really flat for me. Like if this was all stars, I need a better telescope because this just didn't shine and sparkle in the way that I really expected it to. It felt like a very clunky, heavy handed commentary on the prison system. Actually, all of the stats about the prison system and facts about the real life prison system are just footnotes, which kind of feels a little lazy. Also, a lot of the threads that are started in this book just aren't actually wrapped up. Characters are picked up and dropped. A lot of the relationships aren't that believable because they're not really padded out before the drama actually starts. Two of the prisoners who are supposedly in love have to fight each other, but we never see their love. And so I just wasn't that bothered by it when it happened. Whereas it could have been heart-wrenching. It could have been devastating. And I feel like that's what makes me so upset is like when the potential is there, but this just felt unfinished and unrefined. Next up, we have fake accounts. What kind of fuckery is this? <laughs> this is basically marketed as being a book about a woman who finds out that her boyfriend has been running this like conspiracy theory incel account, right, on Instagram. I thought it was a cracking concept, but then he just dies <laughs> on page 20. So then she spends the next like 100 pages just walking around being annoying and insufferable. Then the 100 pages after that, she goes to Berlin and she's annoying and insufferable, but just on a different continent. And I was sitting there like, what happened to the original plot of the movie? Then, get this, <laughs> right at the end of this book, it turns out that he didn't even really die. He faked his own death. Imagine someone faking their own death just to get away from you. And after spending 200 odd pages with this character, I would have faked my own death to get away from her too. <laughs> I just, I was like, this isn't the character I should be rooting for. This isn't the character I should be empathizing with. So yeah, I don't think this was good. Moving on, Insatiable is an ironic title for this book because I had had enough pretty early on. This is very much not, <laughs> not insatiable. Nothing of the sort, nothing of the kind. It's basically a book about, how do I describe this? It's basically about a bunch of rich, posh toffs having these like anatomy defying orgies. <laughs> like they have, they have these group sex sessions and the ways that they contort their bodies, I was like, these people need to be taking up Olympics gymnastics. That is, that's incredible. I was actually reading it. <laughs> Sometimes the way it like described the way their bodies were moving, I would almost like try and <laughs> maneuver my body in that way. And I was like, it's not actually possible. <laughs> it's not, I can't do that. It was very odd. It was a strange, I want to say little book, but it's not even that little. It, it, it's, it just keeps going and going and going. It is relentless. And quite frankly, if I wanted to watch a bunch of rich snobs fucking something, I would just tune into UK Parliament live streams and watch the government fuck the country. This was kind of redundant to me, I guess. <laughs> Idol burning, again, burn it to the fucking ground. Anyways, this is a story about fandom and obsession, specifically within the kind of K-pop realm. It's about someone who is obsessed with this idol who then gets canceled for punching a fan in the face. By the way, we're never told why they did this. Just, <laughs> it's kind of, it's just a, a fact that he did punch someone. And the thing for me is that if you're chronically online, like myself, um, then I think this book doesn't really say anything new that you don't already know. It's just kind of like a series of observations. And then if you're not chronically online, I don't think you would buy this book. So that kind of left me thinking, who is this for? Like, who is this serving? Because frankly, it is not serving. <laughs> Fiona and Jane is marketed as a story about these two friends, but then the friendship is never really shown. We're never really shown these two characters together. They barely interact throughout the book. And so the friendship just isn't that believable. And a lot of interesting ideas are brought up throughout the book, but then they're sort of just dropped and never mentioned again. And instead the paths that it chose to go down were the boring ones. So if you need me, I will be putting up missing poster signs for the plot of this book. I was losing the plot because this book didn't have one. You exist too much. Honestly true. This, this did exist <laughs> too much. Finally a book with some self-awareness. The thing is the title You Exist Too Much suggests abundance, whereas this book was not really giving anything 
at all. It's actually incredibly lacking, I would say. And you know what, I think as I'm filming this video, I am realizing I probably need to stop picking up books about people who have just been dumped because often I end up finding the character so annoying that I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you kind of deserve to be dumped. This is kind of similar in tone and vibe to fake accounts, and I, I didn't like either, so at least I'm consistent. But I would say the one thing that I think this book does really well and does tackle effectively is the concept of therapy and the importance of going to therapy. And that does lead me on to talking about today's partner, which is BetterHelp. And so this segment of the video is a paid partnership with BetterHelp. And I think what BetterHelp do is so important because their mission, their goal, their driving force is to make therapy more accessible. So it's online therapy. This means you can access therapy wherever you are, whenever is most convenient for you. And also by answering a series of questions in this kind of questionnaire, you will be matched up to a credentialed therapist who can help you in as little as a few days. And I always say this, but I think one of the most important things to remember and to consider when you are thinking about therapy is that it's kind of like dating. You do have to shop around a little bit. And so if one therapist isn't right for you, then you can find another one. And BetterHelp makes that really, really easy. And if there is something that is interrupting your happiness or meaning that you're not being the best version of yourself, maybe talking to someone through online therapy could be what helps you to learn effective coping mechanisms and helps you to not bottle up your thoughts and instead be the version of yourself that you want to be. It could not be easier to sign up and get matched with a therapist, so I'll leave my link down below in the description box, but you can head to betterhelp.com slash Edwards and clicking on that link will get you 10% off your first month of online therapy, which is incredible. So you can connect with a therapist and see if it works for you, find a soundboard for your thoughts. So if you are struggling, do consider checking out betterhelp at betterhelp.com slash Edwards and thank you so much to BetterHelp for collaborating with me. Now, the next two books are kind of connected, but there's That One Night and Pucking Around, and these are part of the same series of hockey, <laughs> romance, erotica novels. And I'm including these together because one is the prequel of the other. This hockey series is wild. It's about a reverse harem, or harem depending on where you are in the world, how you pronounce that word. So it's this lady who gets a job as the doctor for a hockey team, and then she meets two hockey players and the manager of the equipment for the team, and they all become puck buddies, shall we say. This book is basically 800 pages of dirty talk <laughs> and smut, and at times the dialogue is insane, genuinely absurd. Like, <laughs> I'll never forget this one scene where she's like, wow, someone's feeling cocky. And then the guy replies being like, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna be feeling cocky when my penis is inside you. <laughs> And I just thought, what? None of these words are in the Bible. This would kill a Victorian child. Like, what am I reading? Also, I was reading that like on the subway. <laughs> and I just thought, please, no one look over my shoulder. In this moment in time, please. Please God, yeah. I mean, this wasn't written with me in mind and I have to consider that, I have to remember that. So the book talk girlies are eating this up and you know what, I have a book recommendation for them and that is the Bible. <laughs> Cause you lot need Jesus. The plot of this book is so shaky, it's a factor seven on the Richter scale. That's how, that's how shaky this is. Anyway, let's move on from that as quickly as possible. The next book is The Cruel Prince and you lot have been telling me to read this book for years, and I just wanna know why. And my second question is, how dare you? <laughs> like, what? You cannot convince me that this book was not just being made up as it went along. Like, there was no planning. There was no forward thinking here. Just vibes, truly just vibes. And I feel like with a fantasy book where there's quite a lot of world building, planning is, pretty essential actually. But in this book, it just gets kind of increasingly ridiculous because there is so much lore, but nothing is really linked and it all just feels a little bit random. I found this genuinely exhausting to kind of get my head around all of the different things being introduced, but there was just no reward. It does what it says on the tin. It is a cruel reading experience, but not in like a fun, cruel summer, Taylor Swift kind of way, just just in a, in a way that was tired. Imagine how tired we are of it. So many characters are picked up and immediately dropped. It felt like this world had just sort of spiraled out of the author's control. And she just said, 
well, I've written it, we might as well publish it. And I was trying to work out what it was about the writing style as well that just wasn't really connecting with me. And I realized it's, it's written in the first person, from the first person perspective, but the number of times I is used is frankly absurd. Like everything is just, I did this, I did that, I did this, now I'm doing this. I think this, I think that. It, it's constant and it just makes for a really clunky reading style. It's genuinely a bit annoying. It's just I, 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 all the time, like a pirate seal glitching. <laughs> this is my impression of the writing style that I wrote down just after finishing reading this book. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a performance by me. This is an exclusive Holly Black parody. Um, I feel sick and sad. Am I the problem? I walk to the bedroom. I think about how annoying I am. What does this mean? What does any of this mean? Am I cruel because I am magic? Or am I magic because I am cruel? I take another step. I swallow. I consciously breathe. I am terrible. But I am mortal. I am mortal and terrible. I take another step. I over explain every action I do and every thought I have. I am making Jack want to kill him. You get the point. You get the point of where I was going with that. That's what it's like, and it is relentless. I, yeah, no, this was not for me. Sorry. Thumbs down. I think we have finally reached the book that I actually ranked the lowest of all, any of these books. This is the lowest of the low. This is a book called Dominoes, and it's a poetry collection. It genuinely feels like a poetry entry to a poetry competition written by an eight-year-old. For me, this had the depth of a very, <laughs> a very shallow puddle. It's monosyllabic, it's overly simple and kind of juvenile. I, yeah, I, I don't know about this. As in like, I don't know how this was published, but it has been, so here we are. Oh, a book about the craft of writing a book is The Novelist. I loved this cover so much. I was like fantasizing about this book for ages because it's beautiful. And then, oh man. I don't think I've ever said that a book is full of shit before, but that is genuinely what this book is mostly about. Like most of this book takes place on the toilet. I'm so serious. It's about a man who is trying to write a novel. We basically follow him over the course of one morning where, I mean, I was mourning my will to go on. <laughs> That's what we were mourning. But anyway, it's basically his like morning routine as a writer and he just basically spends the whole time scrolling through Twitter, vivid details about things he gets up to. There's a long scene that describes toilet paper getting caught in his bum hair. I paid money for that. I paid money for this book. It's all about the different ways that he gets distracted from writing this book. And I think it's meant to be funny and quirky, but for me, I didn't like it. It didn't land for me. It landed like, a nuclear bomb that just exploded in my face. I didn't have a good time. I did not have a nice trip. If this was TripAdvisor, I would I would rate it very poorly. I kissed Shara Wheeler. Now, I really respect the queer utopia that Casey McQuiston has been creating and establishing and developing throughout her literary oeuvre so far through One Last Stop, through Red, White and Royal Blue. I think those books are really fun and silly and you can kind of just get immersed in the risk-free world that they kind of live in where nothing ever goes wrong for too long. Everything is quite risk averse. A lot of the time there are convenient plot elements but for the sake of these books, it kind of does make sense. And so I kind of let them off with the way they've written these books before. However, I Kiss Shara Wheeler is where I draw the line. I'm drawing it. I'm drawing it in the sand. And this is basically Casey McQuiston's way of rewriting the classic high school teen drama, I guess. It kind of feels like a Netflix movie or like a Disney Channel kind of style movie, you know, like Radio Rebel, like that kind of thing. And in this book, Shara Wheeler, who is kind of the popular girl at school, you know, everyone thinks she's going to be prom queen. She suddenly goes missing and she leaves notes for her friends, as well as the main character of our book, who is someone who barely really knows her. They're kind of like academic rivals. And I understand that Casey McQuiston's whole thing is that they take these low stakes plot lines and has fun with them. But for me, this one, I just could not get behind. Like, why were the police not looking for this girl? Were her parents not worried, not even slightly concerned that a teenager is missing. And the end of the book, when she does reappear, 
doesn't make the silliness worthwhile. The payoff is minimum wage. <laughs> it's not good. It's The payoff is on the poverty line. And frankly, I felt robbed. I just, I was like, why did I read this? <laughs> that was, this just felt pointless to me. Okay, two books left. This book is called Daddy, and it is a short story collection that just felt pretty dull to me. I don't really have a lot to say about it, except I wish this short story collection had been shorter. I wish the stories had been shorter, as in like, that they hadn't been written. <laughs> and I was disappointed because I really liked Emma Klein's book, The Girls, and so I had high hopes for this, but they were, they were let down, for sure. This just felt like a shame to me, but I am intrigued to read her other book, The Guest. I think maybe, perhaps her short stories just aren't for me, but her novels are, so I will feed back to you on that in due course once I've read that. Oh my God, you guys, I was editing this video and I realized I missed one from my list. I forgot to, I forgot to talk about one of the books that is one of the worst offenders so far. This book is Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfeld. This is actually the second time I've read a Curtis Sittenfeld book, and the second time a Curtis Sittenfeld book has ended up on my worst books of the year list. She is a repeat offender, which is telling me that I need to stop <laughs> reading this author's books. At this point, maybe she's not the problem, it's me, but I have to say, there is some audacity that you have to have to write a book called Romantic Comedy and then make the character unlovable and the comedy not funny. This is a book about someone who works for basically what is an SNL equivalent. I want to say it's called like the Night Owl, TN TNO. She writes sketches for the show and they are the least funny thing. I have watched paint dry and laughed harder. One of the sketches is about a cheesemonger and she's getting this famous musician to play the cheesemonger and he's naming the cheeses after his songs. And that's it. One of the sketches is like, what would a dog Google search be? Again, this is in the Millennial Olympics and this one got silver. It was this and really good actually in the final round of the Millennial Olympics. This one hurt me. This one, wow. It had such potential, like an SNL book. I thought could be great, but oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, I just had to add that because I would be doing an injustice to this video and to myself if I didn't include that book because car crash, car crash behavior. But now we have found our way to the final book on my worst books of 2023 list, and that is Trust Exercise. Now, I have to say, I found this book literally on the side of the road for free. <laughs> like someone was giving away a pile of books for free. And so I had seen this online and I thought I would pick it up and I read it. I remember reading it in like an airport somewhere. And even though this book was free, I still want a refund. I, st I still think I deserve some kind of compensation. This book I just found genuinely like unreadable because it's just so overwrought and frustrating. It's set at a performing arts college and every character is equally infuriating. I was worried this was gonna make me like commit a crime. <laughs> because I was so angry just reading it. So yeah, those are the books that I did not love so much this year. My hateritis flare up is starting to go back down. Someone got the EpiPen out. <laughs> I'm allergic to bad literature, it's, it's not my fault. So let me know what your least favorite book of the year was that you read. And this is a safe space for us to just share that and move on, let it out. Get it out of your system, use the comment section of this video as like a virtual punching bag, you know, as your virtual stress ball. That's how this video has felt and honestly, I feel wonderful. I feel cleansed. This felt like a cathartic experience and I'm glad that we all shared this. I'm glad you were here to, to go through this with me because I suffered, so now you don't have to. You're welcome. This is my public service. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for all of the support this year. Thank you for being here, I really, really appreciate it. This has been a wonderful year, so I'm so, so grateful. To keep up with more from me, you can head to my Instagram, at Jack Ben Edwards, or my TikTok, which is Jack underscore Edwards. I also have my second channel, and of course, you can subscribe to this one if you're new. So thank you so, so much for being here. All the best, stay in touch. I appreciate you loads, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.